Menax meets with Zalem in the palace conservatory. Zalem, he began, I hardly know why I call thee this night, why I waited not for a time, and yet I do know, too, I had a mission to confer upon someone fitted to perform it. There are others more experienced, yet I choose to give it to thee, thou knowest what it is. Very evident to me was it that this was not what actuated the Astika in his choice, and that it was not for this that he had asked me into the conservatory. He had relapsed into silence, which he presently broke by asking, Hast thou ever heard that my wife gave me a son, and that both wife and son are taken by death? I, one son and a daughter, praise unto Inkel, I have her yet. But my son, the pride of my life, is gone unto Navazamin, the destiny of all mortality. My son, O oh my son, he sobbed. When his emotion had somewhat subsided, he resumed. Zalem, when I saw thee at thy first speech with our beloved Rye four years ago, was it not? I was astonished at thy likeness to my dead boy, and I loved thee then, Zalem. Many a time have I gone to the Zioquithlon to note thee at work in thy studies. Always have the summonses thou hast received at diverse times to attend at this Estikithlon had for thee their prompting motive sight of thee. Yes, sight of thee, lad, sight of thee. He murmured softly, gently, stroking my curls the while. Few days have passed that I have not at some time seen thee, either personally or by name. Yes, I have gone at night and stood by the window, that I might gladden my heart with the sound of thy voice as thou hast sat reading to thy mother. I have watched thee and been proud of thee, Zalem, for in every way thou hast seemed as my own. Thy triumphs in study have made joyful my days, as has also the skill with which thou hast performed governmental missions, for thou wert as my son. Then come and live here, lad, for I want thee near me in this mine old age. Together will we float down the stream of life, thou and I. Perchance I go first, out across the great ocean of eternity. Then will I await thee in the dim land of dreams, where is no more parting, neither pain nor sorrow. Come, Zalim, come. To this tender appeal I replied, Menax, I have often wondered during the years of my abode in Kaiful, what meant thy favors to me? Thou hast ever been more kind to me than any other, yet have ever been reserved and distant, yea, more so than others who could not care overmuch what befell me. Now all is plain. I have looked on thee with affection and loving reverence, and treasured thy kindnesses, and acted according to thy few words of, of advice. Yea, Menax, we will together go hand in hand to the shadowy land of departed souls, Thou for me, or I for thee, waiting the other's coming, which soever the harvester of souls shall first garner. We arose and tenderly embraced, embraced each other. As we parted our clasp, I beheld the only child of the prince, and framed in clustering vines that twined caressingly around her lovely form. As I looked upon her, I thought of that other girl, the Saldu, to whose story I had so recently listened. Nearly the same age, neither of them more than a year my junior, but so widely different from each other as types of womanly beauty. It is difficult to describe a person in whom the deepest interest of the heart is centered, and the greater this feeling, the more difficult will be the portraiture. At least it is so in my case. The reader is aware how the brown-haired, blue-eyed, queenly girl of faraway Sald appeared, how delicate her fair complexion, how high-strung and sensitive her nature, yet with all, how cruel! But how can I picture her whom I loved, her with whom the hope of a chance meeting, even at a distance, made a great part of the pleasure I felt in going to the palace of Menax? She whom I had loved and enshrined within my heart nearly as many years as I had resided in Kaifool, how can I describe her? If the Princess Lolix was on the threshold of womanhood, so was this fair one, the Princess Anzime. Slight, delicate, womanly, the daughter of a long line of patrician ancestry, my senior and superior in the ranks of study at the Zioquithlon, if my junior in years. I loved her, yet carefully concealed the fact. Each of my friends who reads this will know what I feel when I avow unwillingness to describe Anzeme, and bid each to place in this poside life frame the picture of his own best loved one. Each heart recalled a different name, but all sang Annie Laurie. Prince Menax caught sight of his daughter at nearly the same moment as I did, and a look of mild surprise 
overspread his face at her presence when he had supposed the Xanatithlon deserted. Seeing this expression, the Rainu came forward and kissing her father said, My father have I intruded. I heard thee and this, this youth enter, but knew not that thou didst desire privacy, so kept my seat and continued my reading. Nay, my pet, thou hast no need of excuse. I am indeed rather glad that thou art here. But what, may I ask, wert thou reading? It will not be well for thee to study too hard, and this, I suspect, was or is thy meaning when thy word is reading. With a sweet smile dancing over her face and lighting her gray eyes, she replied, Thou wouldst make an excellent reader of the hidden mind. I was indeed studying, but the end justifies the labor. Whosoever shall acquire a deep knowledge of the science of medicine shall be in a position to relieve even those in the agonies of mortal pain and to cure those less gravely afflicted. Is it not a work for Inkle, then, as well as for his children, and is it not such an act done for the least of these, something done also for him? Two girls, Lolix of Sald and Anzime of Poside. A wide continent separated their two countries, but a yet greater distance was between the daughters of the two lands. Lolix, with no sympathy for those in pain, no sorrow for those in mortal agony, Anzime at the very antipodes of such traits of character. For a full minute there was silence while Menax looked at the noble-hearted, dainty speaker. Then clasping my hands with his right and those of Anzime with his left, he said, My child, unto thee I give a brother, one whom I deem worthy to be such. Zalem, unto thee I give a sister, more precious than rubies. And unto thee, Inkle, my God, all the song of praise which fills my breast for thy blessings to me. Here he dropped the hands that had touched together for the first time and lifted his own to heaven. How the touch of that little hand thrilled me ere it was withdrawn. Was I worthy of all this love? No sin yet stained my fair name, and I felt at that moment entirely deserving. If ever it blotted my record, sin was yet to come. But with disquiet I thought of the strange prophecy on that night of long ago. For an instant only this feeling possessed me, and then it fled. I was given to the habit of analyzing men and motives. It was a second nature, so to speak, to consider every question and every possible aspect. So even now I was querying myself as to the meaning of this latest experience. I knew that for Menax, who had so winningly asked me to be his son, I entertained the most profound respect and affection. My life would not have appeared to me too great a price to pay if for it I could have bestowed commensurate benefit on him. And I loved life too. There was nothing morbid about my nature unless exceeding love for my friends be a sign of morbidness. I dwelt a little upon what my adoption meant socially and politically. Thou needest not be told what it must have been to my ambition thus to be placed in so high a niche as I would thenceforth occupy in Atlan estimation as the legal son of a high counselor who by marriage was the brother of the Rye. All this time while considering the situation I was reserving as a choice sensation the pleasure of examining what was the kind of love I felt for her who was my sister. By adoption only, it is true, but who herself, the pet of inner circles and the adored of the people of Kai Fu, would appear before the world as my sister the moment Rai Wallen should officially approve his brother's course. Ought I to feel pleasure or vexation? I looked at her whom I had dreamed of as my wife in case Inkle within his goodness should see fit to grant me exaltation to high places. Could I hope to realize the dream after this unexpected turn of fortune? If I had come to my high place by a different manner, then I could have hoped for the hand of Anzame. But now, my great fortune seemed like an apple of Sodom, bitterness to my mouth, for I was her brother legally if not by cons consanguineous ties. There was a chance that things were not so dark as they seemed, since such adoptions among the lower classes were frequently, yet did not act as a bar to marriage. So thus again the sun came from behind the clouds. The characteristic most marked in the appearance of the girl before me was the simplicity of her attire. That evening her glory of brown tresses was caught in a loose unbraided fall at the back of her shapely head by a plain golden clasp. A long flowing robe clothed her in slender girlish form. No costume could be more artistically tastefully simple than this colorless 
diaphanous fabric tinged just enough with blue to seem pearly white. Shoulder tips of pure carmine indicated the wearer's royalty. Her dress was gathered at her throat by a pin made of a golden bar whereon flashed large rubies, grouped about a center of pearls and emeralds, the whole heightening the color of her cheeks so as to make her seem some lovely human rosebud. Rich as it was quiet, the attire added nothing to the girl's own sweetly dignified loveliness. The pearls emblem of her rank as a Zyle Kenu, the emeralds mark of her not yet having attained political voice, the rubies, gems of royalty, worn only by the Rye or one of his near relatives. Wallen's own sister was Anzime's mother and the wife of Menax. Posai derived her greatness from her educational superiority, a greatness which recognized no sex in its learned ballot holders. But if Atlantis owed all things to knowledge, it was nonetheless true that Atoll's people of ability would not have been what they were had it not been for their wives, the sisters and the daughters, and more than all, the mothers of our proud land. Our grand social fabric was founded on and built by the efforts of sons and daughters who for centuries had respected the lessons inculcated by fond, true, patriotic mothers. Next to that paid to his creator was the homage which a Poseida accorded to woman. We loved our rye and the Astiki. We respected them as much as ever rulers in this world have been respected. But we honored our women more, and rye and prince, sovereign and subject, were proud to acknowledge the holy influence which made all our glorious land of freedom one great home. America, thou art beloved by me, even as was Poseid. Foremost among nations, art thou so because of woman and Christ. Thou wilt keep in the van because of them, and eclipse all the world beside when the happy karmic day shall have arrived, which places woman not below, not above, but side by side of man on the rock of esoteric Christian education. The granite of knowledge and faith which withstands the winds and storms of ignorance. Built on such foundation, the national house shall not fall. Built on other, great shall be the fall of it. Here is wisdom. Myriad serpents are in a man. In thee, keep them. Now ye are slaves. Be ye masters instead. But alas, this way is narrow. Few will to find it. I ask you to stand for our benediction. Beloved, mighty I am presence from the heart of God and the great central sun, we all say together with one voice, Here am I, Lord, send me. 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 I call to Cyclopeia for vision. I call to the great divine director for divine direction. I call for practicality, frugality, and the cosmic honor flame. I call for practical sons and daughters of God to rise up, take the light and the torch of the goddess of liberty, and run with it. I pray for angels to guide us and teach us. I pray for courage. I pray for faith in hours of doubt and fear. And I pray that all sons and daughters of God will understand that when God has given so much, he leaves us in a vacuum because it is our turn to fill that vacuum with our light, our faith, our hope, our charity. Thus, in moments when we have the ball, O oh God, let us run with it. Let us realize, we must be doers, for you have been a doer unto us for so long. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and the Divine Mother, I seal this teaching in the name of all cosmic teachers who have ever given to this planet and all other planetary homes and to our life streams the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. Let us sing to our El Moria in gratitude. One ninety two. 
Please shout your fiats to El Moria.
action with sacred fire, whirling dance, sacred dance, stamping out in harmony. Expand, expand, mighty people play. Expand, expand.